Welcome to E360 TV, the live streaming and on-demand destination for influential voices and enlightened audiences. We offer trending, grassroots, and purpose-driven content across a diverse range of interests. E360 TV is more than just watching programs. We offer the ability to interact with live shows connecting audiences to real, authentic influencers and storytellers while streaming to millions of devices. Real experiences. Raw conversation. One destination for it all. E360 TV. caught me mm, i love that theme song love 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 it because we are here we are fulfilling the promise where two or more come together not something could should would might happen mm, it is going to happen it always does right ah thank you for being here good morning everybody welcome to the first day of march first day of march which is also the last month of quarter number one. How are you as far as being in alignment with your goals, those intentions that you set way back at the beginning of the year? I hope you're on point. If not, keep hanging out and we'll get you there. We're going to show you uh, all kinds of ways through the stories of all of our wonderful guests that we have lined up for the month of March starting today. And it's going to be uh, one for the record books. I guarantee you that. My name is Lauren Michaels Harris and I'm your host of uh, every episode, Monday through Friday, a bathroom moment. So please hit the notifications button so you'll know when we're going live and you won't miss any of the great content over here on bathroom moments. How was your weekend? Uh, my my husband was visiting family, uh, Iowa Christmas, which uh, because of COVID had to wait. He had to wait until they were the lowest numbers in the country before he would go. Thank you, honey. And uh, so he was there all weekend. And let me tell you what I discovered about myself this weekend. I discovered that I don't know how to sit my ass down. Seriously. Um, it took me Saturday. I was like, I don't feel like really doing any work. I don't want to do any housework, any yard work. Um, yeah. And now that the snow is melting here, you know, I want to go out and um, there are branches and stuff. And so anyway, um, it took me, I, I got up at like seven o'clock. I usually get up at four. So I slept in 
And it took me, I would say until one o'clock in the afternoon before I did not feel guilty about just, you ever get like that? Uh, so anyway, I learned that about myself and uh, paid for it yesterday, running around trying to make up for all, what is that? That's like when you say you lose sleep. I'm going to catch up on my sleep. You can't. It's already gone. The sleep you're getting is the sleep you need. So anyway, uh, there we go. You guys, that's the Bella Purpose. Hi, Yolanda Riley, Virginia Hodges. Virginia Hodges, y'all. She's going to be shooting. Um, she's a photographer for the star celebrity. I don't know how I got her, but um, as I'm sure clearly not one of those. But uh, yeah, I'm going to be doing a photo shoot with her for a couple magazine covers coming up here in the next few months. Mm, love you. Miss your face, Virginia. And good morning to the rest of you out there. Uh, Robert Brooker. And uh, oh, there's a bunch of you guys. Hi, good morning. Sherry McQueen, how was your weekend, you guys? I hope you got everything you wanted and you gave everything that was needed, okay? So the bell of purpose means that when you hear that bell ring, something great is happening here. Uh, some great content. You want to back the car up, take a look at it. It may not be roadkill after all. Pick it up, put it in the car, put it in the trunk, put it in the glove compartment, put it in your heart, take it with you. You'll be glad you did. Welcome to the show. As always, my sidekick. This is my version of Ed McMahon. This is Lucy McGillicuddy Ricardo, and we're drinking on just some plain old breakfast blend. Ding. I couldn't touch the bell because my hand was occupied. So anyway, today, you guys, listen, PTSD, right? How many, raise your hands. How many of you um, have dealt with it? And I don't like to, I, I use it in the promo and I regretted it later. Suffered. You know, because um, I don't know. I, I'm working on that one. I don't know if I want to keep that word in. It might be a word that deceives. Because, yeah, it felt like I was suffering. It feel, and it is. Trust me, PTSD is no joke, as you're going to find out today. If you don't know, you will know. And my guest today, Eric Herrera, um, a fellow veteran. Where is my? Oh, there it is. Wait a minute. Hold on, you guys. Prop time. My uh, A fellow veteran even though he was in the army, not the air force. And I'm not biased at all. Just saying, but he served as so many courageous men and women do, um, decade after decade, after decade, after decade. So when I say, uh, thank you for your service and your sacrifice, I'm speaking to all of our military veterans, past, present, and future. And today, Eric is going to talk about what I love about this guy is we have a lot of people that, you know, not to take from anybody, including myself, um, but, you know, we talk about PS PTSD and it just kind of goes, it, it, it sprints through the conversations usually. Not the kind of thing people say, oh, PTSD, tell me about that. Yeah, hold on. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. What? Shut your mouth. It's not like that. People are like, you know, it's like, oh, okay. Oh, look at the time. You know, oh, I just forgot. I got a butt cake in the oven. I'll call you when I'm done. That kind of thing. No, I love, you know, I love this guy because not only does he like to talk about it, work about it, um, spread awareness, create awareness about it. Um, he's written a book about it. And uh, we're going to get into that. So I'm going to get him in here. But before we do, I thought I'd show you a little something, uh, share something with you. Hold on. You guys know I am not techie. That's why when I get to NBC, I'll be so happy. Thank you, Jesus, because there'll be a whole group of people doing all this clicking and stuff, pulling up. So let's take a look. Here is a short video from another uh, military veteran speaking on their journey with PTSD. We all in the military, a lot of times think we're the only one. We don't know that there's this big wave of veterans that have been exposed to trauma that can get help. Some of the symptoms that I noticed immediately for me were the, uh, the restlessness, um, uh, not being able to sleep at night. Just being very uh, paranoid of loud noises, jackhammers. That was suffering inside and shaking, uh, sweating at night, just trying to find an answer, you know, to feel comfortable with what uh, my buddies and I went through. A lot of the relationships that I had, whether they were romantic, friends, family, were all deteriorating because of my PTSD. The things that 
people don't talk about are um, like uh, forgetfulness, um, flightiness, um, just kind of zoning out. It was only after I accepted that I had PTSD. That's why I got really involved in my own mental health recovery. I went to the VA clinic and I was assigned a psychiatrist. She really uh, helped me through a lot of the issues uh, that I was facing. And these classes were um, for PTSD to help help the veterans to uh, try to um, overcome their fears and triggers and, and everything and the tools that you can use to um, control it. Get to the VA and talk to somebody. It will get better. Oh, I was muted. So uh, <laughs> did you guys see my post the other day where I showed like at the beginning of COVID when I was working with people who had never been on Zoom, and I was like, can you hear me? It was just like one of those um, um, flow commercials. What is that? Progressive? Yeah. Where they're like, you do know you're muted, right? Been there, done that. Raise your hand. I know. I know. So anyway, um, PTSD, get your questions ready. Get your comments ready. Let's talk. Let's show each other our souls this morning and see if we can do anything about um, shedding some light on this subject that uh, isn't talked about, in my opinion, nearly enough. So our guest, Eric Herrera, is on his way up the conveyor belt. Put your hearts into it. Put your hearts on the screen and send some light, love, and do a bat. Give this guy a true bathrobe moments. Welcome. Get the hearts on the screen. Here he comes, everybody. Eric Herrera. Well, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Now, let me just tell everybody. Um, you can tell Eric's a big guy, right? Now, let me tell you something. Eric is the kind of guy already he's going to be like, yeah. Oh. Don't expect him to jump around and, you know, but listen closely because there's some platinum platinum nuggets inside of this golden goose let me tell you eric welcome to the show tell everybody where you're at in the world um how where you serve to give us a little backstory if you would just fill in the blanks for us and then we'll get started on this subject today uh yeah sure i grew up on the north side of chicago um, played sports all my life um, after high school i uh, decided to go to college and uh, it really didn't work out for me it, really didn't participate in college. I was more interested in the party atmosphere, things like that. I thought that's what college was. I thought so too, but I, I guess you have been, to go to so. class. So. Oh, oh no. See, I know. Thank you. Uh, okay. So it wasn't your thing. Go on. No, I ended up uh, getting kicked out of Northern Illinois University. And um, a lot of my friends were joining the military at the time. And I really didn't want to stay at home and get a job and go to community college. So I decided to look into the military and uh, that's when I decided to go to the recruiting station and got all my information. Okay. Um, I also had uncles in the military. I had one in the Navy and I had one in the army. Um, I went to my uncle that was in the army because I figured he knew a little bit more than uh, my other uncle would. And I decided I wanted to be a combat engineer and it was the first time I actually had a conversation with my uncle in my entire life. I had actually an hour, converse, hour and a half conversation with him and found out he was a combat engineer in Vietnam too. So he was able to tell me what to expect, what to do and things like that. He ended up going to the same basic training site that I did. So he was able to give me some tips and everything like that and how hot it was. I ended up going to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri in the summertime and it's 120 degree heat with high well, humidity. So it's try Phoenix. Ooh, <laughs> that's where I was stationed. Phoenix. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I get it. I get it. So listen, so when you made this decision, this choice, if you will, to enter the military, because I wrote down what you said, combat engineer. So when you saw that term for that, that position, that AFSC, as they're known as, um, did you look at both words or were you looking at engineer? Ooh, engineer. Look at me. Or what did the combat part of that speak to you? Because it later became your reality. When you signed up, did you really walk all the way around the possibility of being in, amidst, in the midst of combat? Or did it come? Did that realization come a little later? The, as you say, yeah, the engineer caught my mind 
Mm -hmm. And um, during school, I liked math and I liked building things. So I figured, why don't I look into it? And the job description for combat engineer at the time was uh, clearing minefields and building fortifications. Uh, the problem was, is that description was mainly for World War II and Vietnam soldiers. See. And as the Iraq war was coming, uh, there really necessarily weren't minefields anymore. There were mm -hmm. minefields, but the main problem at the time were IEDs. So the military decided to use combat engineers for route clearance and to find these IEDs. So that's kind of like when you go to the company that has an ad in the newspaper and it says, let me come up with a good one. Um, let me see. What, 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 what's a good, what's one of those trick, trick terms for a janitor? You know what I mean? When they, you're a, a custodial engineer or whatever, <laughs> and then you get there because they know if they put out their bomb sniffer, well, I don't know if I want to be a bomb sniffer. What you going in the uh, army for, Eric? Bomb sniffing? <laughs> you mean, so you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So did you really, did anyone sit down, Eric, and say, okay, look, dude, you do realize, let me show you a video. They, they didn't do any of that, did they? Uh, no, the person that I talked to about combat engineer job really didn't know anything about it. And my uncle told me what he did. A lot of things he did in Vietnam was building these fortifications that they needed in the jungles and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that's what he was telling me. And, um, also not necessarily minefields as well in Vietnam, but they were, right. um, but yeah, he Trip just told, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. But, uh, also engineer combat engineers were also called breachers too. So we learned a lot about explosives. So our jobs was mainly getting into things. So World War II, uh, when the stormed the beaches of Normandy, uh, it was the engineers that blew up those obstacles so the soldiers could get through. So the best de depiction of that is in Saving Private Ryan. So okay, when they're, they're, bre they're breaching the uh, barbed wire and things like that, it's the engineers that are going in there clearing the way for them. That's what the, engineers. the jobs okay. were. So... So when you're when you had the conversation with your uncle in Vietnam War, and I know a lot of Vietnam vets, um, they they usually fall into one of two categories. They'll, they'll be very open with you about their experiences, or in the case of like my father-in-law, will not talk about it at all. Don't bring it up. Um, don't we don't suggest a movie about it. Don't give me a book on it for Christmas. And eh, it's nay. So. Um, when your uncle had this conversation with you, did he ha happen to mention, oh, and by the way, there's a little thing that you're probably going to bring home stuck to your, your spirit like a leech known as PTSD. Now, I don't know if when he was in, and that's a great question, if it, Sherry McQueen, you're our research analyst, find out if they talked about PTSD, if you could, uh, during the Vietnam er uh, War era. Was it a thing? Um, I don't, because I don't know when, you know, some things when they, they don't really become relevant until they diagnose it. You know what I'm saying? Like autism. They called autism all kinds of things. They called, uh, um, what is that thing where people read backwards and stuff like that? Um, that learning disability, it's slipping my mind. Maybe I, uh, Alzheimer's, I know that one. Um, you know, where kids, dyslexia, you know, they didn't know what it was, so they didn't call anything. I wonder if that's what, P, when was, you know, PTSD was like that back then. But anyway, did he happen to tell you about any of the residual things that he drugged back with him because when i think when i talk to people like you about ptsd you guys remember that movie back in the day with kevin bacon and all of them flatliners where they you know they went under and when they came back they brought something with them it yeah. feels like that to me that's how it was for me and still is at some points so talk about that if you could um did you have any idea that ptsd was something that was most likely going to find you and jump in your pocket and hitch a ride home with you from your deployments yes or no uh no i did know maybe a little bit but the thing with my uncle was i never spoke to my uncle during my childhood he was a chicago cop for 27 years after the military mm. but he worked night shifts so every time i go play with my cousins he, he would always be asleep sleeping. and never really spoke to him but he was always a happy cheery guy um mm. when i was 19 that was when i actually had a first sit down conversation with him and uh he was open about it and every time i came back he always wanted to talk about it i always wanted to talk about it every time we went to family events he was the first guy i went to because 
he was the person that I could relate to it. And a couple of times when I did come back, he did notice changes in me and sat me down and talked with me about things. And that was one of the things that really helped. Okay. So at what point, how, how far, how far were you down the rabbit hole, so to speak, um, into your, your enlistment, uh, when you started to feel something was happening with you? Um, I mean, was it immediate? What changes did you notice? What were the warning signs that something just ain't right? Um, one of the things I do talk about in my book was an incident that we had on Christmas of 06. Uh, we ended up losing three soldiers that night, and one was really injured. Um, the thing is, is that uh, those were really good friends of mine, and it really did affect me very much. Uh, a couple weeks later, I ended up going on R&R, &R, so I came back home for two weeks. And that's when he first noticed when right as soon as I walked up to him, he knew I was completely different, just the look that I gave him. And that's when he really sat me down and uh, talked to me through it and things like that to be able to help myself get through it. So that was on the front end. But you, according to your book um, and the research that I've done, you 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 kept your tongue to yourself pretty much you may have spoken with your uncle but when you say you broke the silence tell us about that and what that means uh did you live with this struggling trying to understand it why 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 was it your secret i guess that's the best way to put it why why was it a secret um was it shaming it was it you didn't know how to ex express it uh what face to put on it why why the silence uh, it really, I really didn't want to talk about the incidences that happened. The only time I actually ever talked about it was with guys that were actually there with me. Um, other than that, I would give hints, things like that, what I did. My family knew what I did, but they didn't know the, the severe extent of what I went through. Um, that's was hard to talk about. And also at the time when I came back, I was telling people what I actually did. To me at the time, it was just a job. It was, it was, I knew it was a dangerous job, but it was a job. And when I was telling people what I did was finding these roadside bombs, the looks on their faces were just kind of jaw dropping. And it almost felt like they were judging me in a way saying like, what is wrong with you? Why would you? Boy, are you crazy? That? So that's another reason why I kept quiet of what I did. Um, as the years went on, I tried to find things to help me uh, get through it. Uh, I ended up taking a couple of hobbies and things like that. I took up fish keeping, kept my eye, my mind occupied on things. It was a tough hobby, but it kept my mind focused and away from all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, down the road, uh, I ended up finding that I actually had a VA resource center 10 blocks away from my house that I didn't even know of. I ended up going back to college and came across a table in the library that a lady was part of the resource center. Mm -hmm. um, I, didn't, I had no idea that this place was even 10 blocks away from me. I decided to actually go to get therapy. Um, but I was, I was talking about my story, but I felt so nauseous at the time mm -hmm. that I wasn't really ready. I was telling them things that I, f that I felt, and I just felt completely sick to my stomach. I told them, you know what, I'll come back some other time. Uh, mm. I ended up didn't going back, and... Uh, December of 19, I actually had my final breakdown in my kitchen. Just all the emotions that I had built up for those 10, 11 years uh, finally started coming out. I was just got everything off my chest. That's when I realized that, you know what, uh, this was the first step. I felt a hell of a lot better, and I decided to make videos. Um, but I didn't think the videos weren't going to help as much because I'm not that tech savvy, things like that. Mm -hmm. So that's when I decided to start writing. Uh, the more and more I wrote, the better I felt. Um, it was like all that pain and of emotion was leaving me and going onto the pages. I decided mm -hmm. this is actually making me feel better. I'm not going to hold anything back. Uh, so I left all the emotions that I ever had in there. And after writing the book, I don't feel like I'm carrying that anymore. It's all mm -hmm. in the book. And um, mm -hmm. I'm better for it now. I'm more at peace. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got chills when you said that. And so, Eric... The little clip that I showed to set this up, um, did any of those 
uh, flags that those various veterans were speaking of. Did any of those uh, resonate with you? Uh, yeah, I used to have nightmares every day. Um, I wouldn't sleep as much, things like that. It wasn't until when I had my final breakdown and started writing, I didn't have any more nightmares. I Not a single one. I haven't had a nightmare in the past year. So was the nightmare of witnessing fellow uh, soldiers sacrifice their lives doing what you had to still get up and do because to me i don't know you know if i'm in a group you know you know that bond you know that bond mm -hmm. uh you get up and you do the same thing every day and all of a sudden a day happens that forces you to never wake up that same person ever again and you don't go into the day knowing up oh, these are my final moments as this guy i'm going to be changed forever in about 20 minutes we don't know that so what was it about the nightmares? What was it where you, I've heard a lot of um, uh, not just veterans, but people dealing with PTSD from all sorts of traumatic experiences that they avoid sleeping, that the lad, they have to take a bunch of stuff, sleep aids. And, and even then they find themselves locked inside of the kind of dreams. I guess that's what makes a nightmare. Uh, one of the elements where they know it, they're in a dream, but they can't come out of it. They try to force themselves to wake up, but it just pushes them deeper. Um, how much of this do you think is attached to when they say you cannot unhear what you've heard and you cannot unsee what you've seen? Um, was this playing over and over and over and over? What, tell us what you were seeing inside those nightmares, if you could, if it's okay. A lot of my nightmares were about the Christmas day. That was the first time I ever <clears throat> experienced anything that was ever like that. Um, Christmas was, day? Yeah, oh, Christmas of 06 when we lost our three soldiers and one was severely injured. Um, All at when one at one WAP. And one incident, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, it ended up being a roadside bomb uh, that was called an EFP at the time. So an EFP is an IED that has a, a laser to it, and this laser detects heat. So these laser these lasers would be pointed at an angle to where when a vehicle would go by it, it would detect the heat of the engine. And that's what set off these IEDs. What these EFPs were, they were basically large copper cylinders. Um, they were giant bullets practically, and nothing would be able to stop them. They would go through anything like butter. And this EFP actually had about three to four of these cylinders in it, and it ended up, uh, yeah, killing three of our soldiers and injuring one. Where were you when it happened? I was in the vehicle behind them. I was the gunner for the uh, my lieutenant's vehicle. So you saw it? Yeah, I did. Wow. And, um, Bye, also, honey. Have a great day. Also at that time you look great. Was, uh, was the first time I actually fired my weapon at someone. Uh, so that was also another incident that actually happened. Was that in conjunction with the explosion? Yeah. So there was a person out there by the bomb. Yeah. Uh, those are, yeah, those uh, two individuals uh, on top of a building that uh, detonated this IED. And what happened to them? Did you find them? Did you catch them? You uh, yeah, them? I, I ended up returning fire to the enemy. Yeah. Did you hit them? I think I did, yeah. Okay. Let me, so then that's the whole, and the reason I push that is because it's, it's one thing when you see what you see happen to the vehicle in front of you. And then you have to put another layer of something else that doesn't feel any better. You might think it will in the moment, but then later you got to live with, you know, it's like you got Siamese twins attached to you, mm -hmm. um, known as P, T, and S, D. So, woo. Let's, let's take our break and then we come back. You guys on the screen is the book that Eric has written um, detailing his experience, uh, his life clearing the roads uh, of Iraq. And boy, it is a riveting story. Uh, trust me. We're going to go to break. And when we come back, Eric, um, if it's OK with you, I'd like to go a little deeper into. Uh, let's get inside the egg. We've touched on the shell. Let's get in there and uh, get all up inside the, the yolk, if we could, if that, if that makes any sense. Um, and I'd love for you to share with people uh, some of the some of the mindset that you've used 
and that you share with others, and that's also within your book as the, the takeaway component, um, on how to just begin the process of understanding what the P, the T, the S, and the D all stand for, because each one of them is a big piece of the overall uh, story, right? Yeah, it is. Okay, when we come back uh, more with Eric Herrera, uh, you guys, don't go away. We'll be right back. Alrighty then, welcome back to the show. You're inside of today's installment of Bathroom Moments. I'm your host, Lauren Michaels Harris. Today's the first show of March, so I'm glad you're here. And I uh, want to say thank you, uh, first off, uh, to my sponsor for today's show, Intention Pin, where you can go over and have your very own Intention Pin created from uh, front to back, top to bottom, side to side. Here's mine with its inscription uh, through me, not from me. And uh, this is a real thing, you guys. Uh, I use it every day with intention and uh, just get over and check out what they're doing. If you have any questions, hit me up, DM me. I'll be happy to tell you how it's working in my world of intention. Our guest today, uh, returning right now, Eric Herrera. Eric, we saw your commercial uh, for your book on Amazon.com. Um, uh, before we get deeper into the book, I'd like you, if you could, uh, first of all, one quick question. How soon after the incident? with your, your, your mates, um, did you have to go back out on another um, uh, bomb hunting expedition? How soon after that? As we came back from mission, um, things have to be done. So incident reports have to be made, things like that. So there was a lot of things that went wrong that night after the initial incident. Mm -hmm. We were out there longer than we should have been. Um, that's everything I explained in the book. Uh, and we came back, we ended up having to do the incident report. We had to speak with the chaplain, speak with commanders, things like that, of what actually happened. Um, they wanted us to go out the next day. Uh, and they wanted us to go back to where the incident happened. Oh, a lot of us were like, uh, you gotta lack, be kidding me. Lack of a better word. Yeah. You gotta be fucking kidding me. Right. So what the hell? Right. And we went, we went back, we, we protested against it because it was like, we were down one vehicle, you know, th things like that. How are we going to go back out there? Um, they gave us a day 
and then they told us no but you have to go back to where that happened so uh th that mission i think my ass never was ever puckered so tight in my life uh, no so, that's right and um we ended up going back out there and then i ended up seeing where i ended up shooting because at this time this was a night mission so we really couldn't see anything and being out there in the day they wanted us to go back and look at it and it was the most it was like really torture it's like imagine some like a like a rape victim or something like that and being forced to go back to where this incident happened or have to face your accuser the oh. next day so that's kind of like what this was it was like really we have to do this so a lot of us were really upset about that but i you know i get it i'm you know last year one of my young nephews a college student he got in the car you know crazy running around anger issues and uh you know how kids will do 19 years old and he um totaled his car out in a, an abandoned field you know out in the middle of nowhere thank goodness uh, his phone was in his pocket because if it had been separated from him when he was ejected from the vehicle, he'd have died out there. But anyway, when the family went to the, the wreckage yard to to take a look at his car, they, they went live on it. And there were like six of them there. And every single one of them, including the men, were crying simply from looking at the car that was literally severed in half. You know, in the blood splatter and the stuff, just they weren't even there. He, the victim, wasn't even there. They're looking at the aftermath, which is what we're talking about here. And they all were just sobbing. And it was, I, I couldn't even finish watching it. And nobody even died there, you see. So I, I can't even imagine. So here's what I'd like for you to do. Because, oh, there's so much to this. There's so much to this. So, I want you to go where you feel you need to go with this in order to to get to the point where you've given us what you came to give us as far as some some hope and some some starting places for those of us trying to understand all four of those uh, letters that comprise something that some people never make it back from. PTSD is our subject today, everybody. If you have any comments, put them in. We're going to get to those in a minute. But Eric, I'm going to give you the floor. I'm going to step out for a second. And I, if you could, can you take us through what it felt like that next day. I mean, I can only imagine that as you move closer to the site, you have to get up wondering, am I putting on my shirt for the last time? Am I putting on my boots for the last time? Because that at that very point the day before, at something during the day before, you were with all those people. Mm -hmm. You, I bet your mind said this time <laughs> yesterday, we were all kicking it and yucking it up and, and look at today, what will be tomorrow? Tell us how you did it and how you continue to do it. I know that's a lot to squeeze into a little bit of time and there's no way you could adequately do it justice, but I'd be appreciative if you could try to just take us uh, from where you were to where you are and how you got there. Can you do that? Yeah, I can. Okay, you guys, I'm gonna step off. Yeah, the floor is yours. Yeah, I was just saying that, that night being Christmas day, we were actually the only unit that was out there during that day. Um, there was no other units that were actually out during that night. So we kind of did protest that night because since our mission was to uh, clear movement for other soldiers, uh, there was nobody out that night. So why would we even be out there? So that was another thing that was really upsetting about what was going on. Um, going through that, uh, a lot of things have blanked my mind. I ended up uh, the next day when we did actually get a break, we put those soldiers on the plane back home. That was probably one of the most touching and emotional experiences I ever did, putting them back on that plane to go back home. Um, even memory loss, some of it. Uh, one of uh, the <clears throat> one of the guys that we lost was actually one of our armorers, and I was having trouble with one of my weapons, so I wanted to talk to him and get my weapon fixed. It completely blinked my mind that we lost him the day before. I thought he was still with us. And that's kind of when it finally hit me that, wow, they actually really are gone and the emotions just kept pouring out again. Um, for the years, yeah, just going over that during my mind, I would go over that day over and over again. That's why all my nightmares were coming through. Um, I tried different things and in the beginning, things weren't really helping out, but the more and more I went through it, the more and more I learned about 
PTSD and things like that. It's finding things to better myself. It took a long time, but there's really no timetable on <clears throat> how long you get over the, uh, your troubles. Um, it took me 10 years, and for the past year, I've been working on things. The biggest part that I suffered with was pretty much behind me now, but I still have little quirks, things like that, that uh, I'm still working on. I can't get over. Uh, uh, for a number of years, I couldn't even drive by myself because um, I would just be so vigilant and things like that on what was on the side of the roads. Uh, there was a point where I was actually having people drive me everywhere because I was almost getting in accidents by myself driving around. Um, little things. Uh, I can't wear college shirts anymore because uh, things that I had to wear in the military, a lot of that was around my neck and it bothers me a lot. Um, things like now, like polos and hoodies now I can, it's a little bit more tolerable, but having college shirts is still something I'm getting over. Um, but it's a, it's a slow process and I'm willing to do it. And, um, I'm also have friends out there that always come and talk to me and that's another thing is that people don't believe that there are actually people out there that talk to you people will listen you just have to ask for that help there's always that stigma that being a guy that you have to keep your emotions and things like that um, I thought that same way too and the more and more I talked with people the better and better I felt um, that's what you have to do just go out there and talk with people and you'll feel better about yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. I know that couldn't have been easy, um, um, but I appreciate everything that you just shared with us. And so can I ask you, you know, you, I, I know that you were close to these guys that you lost um, because you have, you guys may have noticed in Eric's promo for the book, there's a shot of a tattoo on an arm. Tell us about that um um kia which stands for kill the action and then you have four of your buddies um on your arm can you tell us why why you put that there it's interesting and i think people need to understand you know a lot of us a, a fight or flight we run out of the room known as the trauma and we last thing we want to do is return to the proverbial scene of the crime if you will but you've now taken um the chalk outline if you will of each one of those people because how can you not when you look at their names birth and death dates see them the essence of the person who was that space that is now empty in the universe because they're no longer within it but their memory is tell us why that was so important to you and how it played a part in your recovery um from some of this ptsd yeah i, I got the tattoo after my first deployment, um, we, we, yeah, we did lose the three uh, brothers on Christmas Day and uh, three months to the day we lost another soldier who was also another dear friend of mine. Mm -hmm. um, I did not want them to be forgotten. That's a big thing that ends up happening. Um, Way too much. So I came up, came up with designs on what, on what I wanted to do. I'm not an artist, but I wanted something simple, but I wanted something to memorialize them. I wanted to be reminded of them every day. Um, another big reason why is um, if any of your viewers have ever been to Arlington Cemetery in Washington, D.C., there's the visitor center that you walk up to. And when you go past the visitor center, to the right is where all the procession is for this per procession staging area for when they bury the soldiers mm -hmm. when you go straight you go up to the hill and usually there's famous people that are buried along this route but up on top of this hill is the tomb of the unknown soldier yeah. to the left is the rest of the cemetery <clears throat> where all the other world war ii world war one all those other soldiers are <clears throat> when you go to arlington cemetery everyone goes straight they go to the tomb of the unknown soldier there's very select feel that very select few people that actually go to the left. When I went there to visit uh, one of my buddies who's actually buried there, it was just real. I just took a moment. I just stood there and watched 
all the people go straight. There was nobody going to the left. All those hundreds and thousands of soldiers that are to the left are kind of forgotten by everybody You got else. the unknown soldier and then you got the forgotten soldiers. Yeah. So mm. it was us oh. walking down the street and only being us and a select few people in that area. Um, mm. It was really troubling for me uh, that all these soldiers are kind of forgotten and a lot of them need to be uh, be learned about and mm -hmm. being remembered. And That's be, why yeah. I have it on my arm. Uh, I go, I go every once in a while trying to visit some of the soldiers because they're all across the country. The, my brothers that are buried, mm -hmm. and I, I take my kids and I tell them the stories about them. Mm. Um, one of them is even named after uh, my son. Wow. So that's how much these guys mean to me. Right. And, you know, I get it because, you know, I have a necklace that I have commissioned that has three stones on it that represent the three boys that were in my very first foster home, out of the first out of 22. And when I got out, I think I've told you guys this before, when I got out all those years later, the first thing, even before I looked for my birth mother, um, I went looking for them and found out that none of the three made it out of the foster care system. They, we were like seven, eight, nine, eleven, and um, I was the oldest, but none of those three made it out alive. No one, the oldest was 14 years old when he perished all within um, through abuse and things like that. And I know now every day, you know, especially when I'm speaking to kids on stage, I'll wear it and I'll constantly rub it when I'm speaking to the kids because I have to remember to keep myself out as much as possible that I'm speaking um, on behalf of these uh, three uh, fallen heroes, which, uh, uh, gave me things that oh okay <laughs> that gave me um i hope that wasn't priceless no. uh, that you know they gave me what i needed many times during my journey uh it was there because they placed it there and it was there before i even realized i needed it and so i owe them a, a debt of gratitude that i could never repay other than through memory and honor so i get it now i also want to say to people out there you guys PTSD, you know, I've had two things where I know I dealt with it really severe. Of course, I did from a lot of the stuff from when I was a kid. But as an adult in the military, I got carjacked one night and uh, held a gunpoint and took to an alley and had to strip down to my underwear in the middle of a, a rainstorm. And then, you know, one one way alley with, with dumpsters at the end and they backed up the car. And I thought they were going to squish me against the wall. I'm looking for where can I jump, you know, and for months I would be driving and I could swear I the car that you know that because I had a rental that night because it was I was in Phoenix and my car floated away so I had a rental and they wanted the rental they wouldn't have carjacked me for my Toyota to sell trust but they did for this Firebird and every time I saw a white car I thought it was them you know I was paranoid because they took my wallet I thought they were going to come to my house um I got hit a few years ago by a semi on 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 uh Halloween and I couldn't drive on a highway for four years. I took back roads. I don't care if it took me five hours to get five minutes. I took back roads because I was scared. Let a truck come up. I had to almost stop in the middle of the freeway. I couldn't even pull over. So there were paralyzing after effects. And so what would you tell us? Do you have something, a process that you go through to keep yourself grounded? How do you bring yourself back from the brink of what happened when you had the breakdown in the kitchen. Do you have things in place? Are there books you read, podcasts you listen to? Do you go to a therapist? What do you do to keep this thing manageable? Um, when I was in the military, I loved music. Um, there was a point where I couldn't even listen to music in my car anymore because on missions I would be, I'd be the gunner and I would have my headphones in to listen to music because i mean sometimes yeah keep yourself awake most of the time mm -hmm. um when i came back i did not listen to music at all that was something i couldn't do when i was driving so i would listen to sports talk radio um i'm slowly getting back to music in my car um in the past year i i do listen to a little bit more things like that i'm an 80s baby so i still listen to all that old 80s music rock and everything like that that's what Excuse i like me, i graduated high school in 1980 ain't nothing old about the 80s <laughs> so <laughs> so 
Um, but yeah, now I listen to podcasts too, things like that. Sure. And that's why I like to go on them to get more awareness about this and what we actually did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you, what would you say, Eric, um, we can all do to perpetuate healing through conversation about these types of, uh, situations, um, from A to Z with PTSD. And also if you could, the alcoholism and homelessness and suicide rate of our veterans who come home and carry these leeches uh, with them. They're stuck to them and they don't, and oftentimes in places where you can't see yourself. Um, I have a nephew who served in Guantanamo Bay and he, it took him about nine years. He's just getting to where I see glimpses of that kid that I used to know so well, um, you know, he just had a baby, uh, um, you know, and I think that has helped. Uh, he got married, that helped. But for a long time, we thought we were going to lose him because he was constantly in the behavioral sciences unit at the VA for observation because they were afraid he was going to kill himself. And it's a horrible, horrible thing. It's, it's you know, you're waiting on that phone call and you feel guilty even about that. Why am I thinking that phone call is going to come? What's wrong with me? So, um, you know, what can, what insight can you give us? Because this book, there's a lot in there, folks. Get over to Amazon.com. Take us into the book. Let's do that as we get. We got about eight minutes left. Why don't you tell us why you wrote it? What's in there? I read all the reviews and somebody in there said, um, I have them. Some, somebody in there said, uh, here it is. You got all your stuff right here. She goes, um, <coughs> excuse me. What did she say? She said something, something about, um, it's a great book, but not everybody should, you know, you got to be ready. You got to be ready for what's in there. I was like, ooh. And you know, that's the very thing that's going to make everybody go, ooh, what's she talking about? And run to it. So that was really good on her part. But what can people expect? Because I have a feeling a lot of us are going over to get the book, A Bomb Hunter Story. And I, 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 I will get it. And uh, so tell us why you wrote it, what's in it, and as a, as a survivor and a person working through current PTSD, what should I look for inside that can uh, help me manage? Yeah, I'll start off about what we actually did. A lot of people don't know about us and things like that. <clears throat> so our missions were roughly between 8 to 12 hours a day, mm -hmm. and we would go 5 miles an hour down the road and look out the window for these roadside bombs. Um, they were just sitting there in plain sight? No, in, in Baghdad, my first deployment, there's literally trash piles everywhere. So a lot of what these insurgents would do was hide these IEDs in these trash piles. But we were going out six days a week, and we would memorize these trash piles. And if we noticed one of these trash piles out of place, we knew that there was something there nine times out of ten, and mm. it would something be there. Um, we would go out on mission with uh, between six to well, four to six vehicles. Um, it changed over the deployment. We would uh, be in these things called RG thirty ones. Um, they were a little bit, they were a lot bigger than Humvees and a little bit more bomb resistant. But the main thing that we used, I actually have a small scale model. Mm -hmm. It's called the Buffalo. Okay. So it's a very large vehicle. And it's about a six to eight man vehicle. And the whole thing behind this vehicle is this large arm that's on the front of this vehicle. Mm -hmm. And on the front of this vehicle, it's got this kind of like spork looking thing. Yeah. And we would use this thing to interrogate <clears throat> things on the side of the road, pick things up, move things around. And that was our, we were the only unit that had this vehicle. So that was our main tool and the vehicle that we had to protect because that's what was our main weapon against the enemy. Um, most of the time we would find something and we got so busy my first deployment that we would go maybe not even two days without finding something. Our unit alone found 126 IEDs in 15 months. And that's not including the ones that have blown up on us or the fake ones that we have found. Do you have any idea? Do, does the military, I'm sure they do, but do you guys get Intel as far as like how many um, servicemen and women have been lost because of these 
IEDs that you discover? I'm sure there's a number, but there's other things for loss of life. But um, yeah, it I mean, does be, it happen a lot? <clears throat> uh, yeah, it does, especially to us. I mean, as I said, we would go not even two days without finding something. Mm. Me and myself, I've been blown up twice, but a lot of my other fellow soldiers have been blown up three, four, five times. Now, there's um, something you don't hear every day. You know, I've been blown up twice, right? Yeah. You know. So, how you doing today, Eric? Uh, I'm doing very well today. Um, my mind is clear on a lot of things. I'm thinking straight a lot more and mm -hmm. at peace, and mm -hmm. I'm enjoying life you now. There you go. Well deserved. Well deserved. I want everyone out there, you guys, really think about this, and especially wherein it pertains to our veterans. Um, you know, I have a real issue with every time you meet a veteran, we go, thank you for your service. Nothing's wrong with that. But once in a blue moon, maybe consider saying, thank you for your sacrifice. Because there are so many unspoken sacrifices that um, our service people uh, give up and never get acknowledged for. Um, and they don't bring it up. And I just think we can do better. I really believe we can do better. And so, Eric, um, I'm going to I'm going to challenge everybody out there to please go over the book. What is the book like? Twelve ninety five. Yeah, right. Twelve ninety five. Head over and get the book. If you get the book and you read it and you do not think it has value, then you send it to me. You send me that Gmail and I will reimburse you personally your shipping and your twelve ninety five. OK, now I'm going to have you send me the book so I can give it to somebody who really can use it. But. I'll give you your money back. That's how important I feel that this topic is. So I'm challenging each of us today to not only get the book, but if you don't want to read it, get in and give it to someone who can benefit from it. Um, Eric and so many others have sacrificed so much in order to give us a story that we would never be really willing to write ourselves. And that's why we show each other our souls. We share with each other our stories. No two are the same. Eric has done things that none of us could do, and we have done things that Eric couldn't do. So, Eric, I want to thank you and commend you and celebrate with you um, this, this um, purpose that has been chosen for you and that you clearly have chosen in return. And I honor you as a fellow veteran. I honor you, honor you as a fellow uh, human doing because you are doing. You're not just sitting there being. You are doing. And that makes all the difference in the universe. So I appreciate you. And tell everybody, this is your Jerry Springer moment. If they were to forget everything we've talked about this morning, except for one piece, what would you hope that one piece would be that could uh, help them with the situation or just anything in their lives? Uh, the main thing I took away from this is always have a plan. The problem with a lot of soldiers is when they leave the military, they don't have a plan for after the military. Um, that's when things go really bad. That's when it leads to homelessness, drinking, drugs, things like that. Mm -hmm. I had wanted to join the Chicago Police Department when I left, but when I went in, I failed a lot of the hearing tests. I failed the hearing test for TSA too as well, so I couldn't get those jobs. So I did kind of come down to a, a downhill moment where I go, oh, what am I going to do now? Right. And I ended up going back to school. I got my bachelor's yeah. degree uh, in business administration. Uh, the military paid for everything, and I'm glad that I did it. Um, with that, I would have never known about the uh, Veteran Resource Center that was 10 blocks away from my house. Mm -hmm. Always have a plan. If you don't, things could get really bad really quick. There you go. Have a plan. And a plan automatically pick a piggybacks when we say what when we ask for and when we share with others about what we feel we need. A plan is built into need. It's when we say, this is what I want. Want is built in with a wish. Think about that. It'll make sense, I promise. Eric Herrera, thank you so much. Everybody get over and get your copy of the book. Here it is. I'm going to pop it up on the screen. There it is, A Bomb Hunter's Story, available now on Amazon.com. Simply type in either the name Eric Herrera, as you see it on the screen, or the title, and it'll take you right to it. Eric, thank you so much for being with us today. Continue doing what you're doing, and the same goes for each of you each of us. Together, we can make great things happen. Separately, eh, 
not so much out today won't you please and be the blessing that you would like to receive be the gift that you would like to receive and see within the world today won't you do that join me again tomorrow morning when my guest will be sunny von cleveland doing big things burning up all of the social media platforms with his shock jock message so um of hope and inspiration mind you so come tomorrow morning and um enjoy all things sunny von cleveland eric i can't wait for you to come back um i'm gonna order my book right when i get done here i'll do a review and you'll know i finished it all of you i challenge you too I'm going to hold true to my th my my promise. If you get the book and you don't feel you have any value from it, send it to me and I'll return all your money. Um, God bless you all. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Thanks for starting your week off with me and with each other here on Bathrobe Moments. And remember, it's not that hard to show someone your soul if you realize you really have one. Have a great one. Thank you, Eric. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Da -da -da -da.